So let me add my greeting as well. Happy Mother's Day to all mothers and mother-like figures in people's lives. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today. I was looking at a card for my mom, and I saw this sentiment, and I ended up not buying this card because I really didn't like the card design, but it was, mom is another word for love. I just thought that was so sweet. So I wrote that on the card that I got mom. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) American greetings, I'll give them credit if mom asks where I got it. All right, well, I want to remind you also that right after service, um, we do have a gift, and it's for everyone. We have ice cream for anyone and everyone who wants it, um, not just the moms in our lives, so uh, make sure you grab that cup uh, of Culver's ice cream on your way out. So, kids, you are now dismissed to go to Kids Connect. Well, they're really quiet. Usually they're running out of here. You can, you can, you can tell the, the Riley family isn't here today because <laughs> Silas, Silas rips right out of here. I do want to say that um, Tim's mom asked him to go to church with her at her church. Um, so that's where Pastor Tim is today. Um, happens to be his old church that he came from, so that's going to be really interesting. Um, but anyway, um, so today... Today we are in the sixth week of our um, series called Life in the Light, A Letter to Ephesus. And we are finally going to be taking a look at that one verse that gives our message series its name. Pastor Janine talked about it about three or four weeks ago when we went through um, uh, chapter two of the letter to Ephesus. But um, it's the fact that we are called to live as children of light. And we'll get there in a little bit, but we're finally, finally there where we get to dig in a little more than we had before. And here at Connection Point, you know, we talk a lot about being a disciple-making church. We all want to be disciples ourselves, but see, we believe that, that we're supposed to take it a little bit further, that not only are we supposed to save that and keep that for ourselves, but we're to go out and make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. And it makes sense. First of all, Jesus commanded us to do that. We call it the Great Commission. But in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus said this. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, that's reason enough that we should be a disciple-making church. If Jesus commands it, we should do it. After all, the command is to obey everything I have commanded you. But besides that, it's just a good way to live. Living as a follower of Jesus Christ with everything that he has given us just makes sense. And if it makes sense, and we've received that gift that we were invited to consider in the very first week we talked about this letter, the gospel... Wouldn't we want to share that with other people so they can also experience that gift of Jesus' grace? That was, I love that in that, in the, I don't remember which song it was now, but a fountain of grace, a fountain of grace that he has poured out over us. So that's, that's why we're, we want to be a disciple-making church. Also here at Connection Point, we talk about disciple isn't just coming to church on Sunday and then doing whatever you want, living however you want to live the rest of the week. No, being a disciple is an everyday responsibility. It's an everyday response to the gospel. You see, it's not just Sunday morning. It's we're supposed to live that way and be that way every day of our lives. We define it using Mark 1.17. In Mark 1.17, Jesus said to, um, well, definitely to Andrew and Simon, possibly to James and John, depending on where you think this fits in. But nevertheless, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, we define it this way. An everyday disciple is someone who is following Jesus, someone who is being changed by Jesus, and then someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. That mission is the mission we just talked about, going out and making more disciples. And our vision here at Connection Point is this. We, want, we strive to be everyday disciples who are becoming everyday missionaries everywhere. 
We're not supposed to keep it for ourselves. We're supposed to go out. We're supposed to be the missionary. Did you know that when we expect people to come to us, we're asking them to be the missionary, to come to us? It's hard to come in those doors if you're not familiar with who Jesus is. We're called to go out and be an everyday missionary everywhere. And I like to add, we work, live, and play. And let me just remind you, because we have done this every week so far, that every letter from Paul to the churches is a direct communication urging them, the churches, to become everyday disciples. And quite honestly, if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us today. Those same letters are urging us to become everyday disciples as well. Two and a half years ago, when Pastor Tim first got here, his very first sermon series was on one of Paul's letters to the church in Philippi. We call it Philippians. And it was all about how to live as an everyday disciple. And then about a year ago, we went through the book of Colossians, the, the letter from, the, uh, from Paul to the church in Colossae that was teaching us how to live as everyday disciples. And now we're in the book of Ephesians or the letter to Ephesus, that city in Turkey that Tim has talked about quite a bit. And it's urging us to become everyday disciples. You see, what was good then still applies to us today. And if you are just joining us or you've missed a couple of the the messages I mentioned that we're in the sixth week, I just want to remind you that they are available online. If you go to our website or on our app, we have a media tab or a media button, and you can catch up. You can, you can go back and, and re- review any of the ones that you would like to. So, let's finally dig in to the letter to Ephesus, starting in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And Paul says, follow God's example, therefore. Time out. We all know what happens when we see the word therefore, right? What do we have to do? We have to go back. Thank you, Ashley. Good job. Yeah, we have to go back. So what, what, where did Paul just come from? And let me remind you that this was, a, this was a letter. So there were no chapter numbers, right? And so it just flows in. As a matter of fact, in my Bible at least, the end of chapter 4 and verse 1 of chapter 5 is, is almost mid-sentence. It's like you can't really even tell that there's a break. So what happened in, that we looked at last week? Well, we talked about that um, we're all called. We're invited by God, and our answer is to be yes to whatever he asks of us. We are to put off our old self, put on our new self, right? And then he went through and talked about how we're to treat each other. Remember, we talked a lot about anger. But but Paul goes on, and, and basically he's telling us that we're to treat each other with kindness and compassion and love. So he's saying, therefore, follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. When Paul says, follow God's example, some translations of this actually say, imitate God. That's who we're supposed to imitate. Imitate God. Walk in his ways. How do we imitate him? Well, we're loved, so we're supposed to walk in the way of love. And that love is agape love. That's selfless love, not selfish love. It's all about everyone else and not about me. Why? Because that's the way Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us. How did did Jesus really love? I believe believe he tells us, I kind of call it his mission statement. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45, he says, Therefore, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are to love, we are to walk in love by serving and giving, if we're going to love the way Jesus loves. And notice that we're to live or we're to love as a fragrant offering, a fragrant offering. Have you ever wondered about that? What does that really mean? Why was Jesus' offering his sacrifice on the cross? Why was that fragrant and pleasing to God? Well, I personally have never been um, in the first century temple where they did animal sacrifices. Um, but my, I imagine that if like at Passover where they're sacrificing all these lambs time and time again and they just put them aside, you know, they're starting to rot, probably doesn't smell too good. And, and I like to think that a burnt sacrifice 
would smell like a barbecue, but remember, they burned these animals up, these bulls and these goats and these lambs that they gave as, as burnt offerings, they burnt them up to nothingness. And my guess is that didn't smell too good either. But when Jesus died on that cross, when he was the final sacrifice that we had to have, when he was the once for all sacrifice, that was pleasing to God. And it smelled good. So when you love others, when you're out in the world and you're loving others, you're showing kindness and compassion to others, do you do it as a fragrant offering or do you do it begrudgingly or because you have to? Or is it hard when God says, love your enemies? Or is it a fragrant offering? Paul is calling us, Christ is calling us to love the way he did and to be a fragrant offering. And then Paul goes on. He says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. You see, that word but, Paul is, he's, he's telling you, it's kind of like therefore we have, where we have to go back. He's switching gears here. He's saying, you know, you're to walk in love. That's who you're supposed to imitate. Another word here could be so, so don't live this way. He says there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. I'm going, what? How do you live that way? How can I live that way? You know, there are times I have to confess that I see those billboards and it says, hey, the Mega Millions is now $363 million. Hmm. I wouldn't mind playing that. But isn't that being greedy? But Paul says there shouldn't even be a hint. I think what Paul is saying here is, hey, if you are imitating God, if you are walking in love, then the way you live your life, the way you show who he is, no one should be able to speak badly of him. Because what that word hint means, means there shouldn't be even a mention of. But I think it's more about, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to, no one should be able to say, oh, look at him, look at Pastor Mark, he played the lottery, he's greedy. Shouldn't live that way. Even though the truth is, we are all going to fall at some point, right? I mean, all, for all have fallen, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us is sinless. And chances are, we're going to live that way. We're going to, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. Even if you've been following Jesus for 25, 26 years like I have, there are times when I'm going to stump, stumble, and I'm going to fall, and I'm going to sin. But I think what, what Paul is calling us to is he says, hey, you're different. You don't have to stay there. That word holy people, holy means set apart. It means you're different. If you're different and you're holy and you're set apart, then live your life differently so that no one can speak badly of God or the way you're living. I find it interesting because it's real easy to say, hey, that this verse says, hey, don't do this, don't do this, don't be greedy, don't have any sexual immorality, don't be impure, so you become holy. But that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you are holy. When you said yes to Jesus' invitation to follow him, if you have, then you became righteous. You became holy, set apart. So live your life as if you are. Live your life differently. And as I said, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are going to be those times when we, when we stub our, our feet, when we, when we make a mistake, when we sin. And I think the difference is, is if we are a holy people, we don't stay there. We make a conscious effort. We, we, we pray. We, t- we, we go to the Lord and ask for that forgiveness and say, you know what? I'm going to do everything I can to not do it anymore. It's not, a, it's not a passive thing where we go, oh, well, I sinned again. No, it's active where we're supposed to turn away and live a life in such a way that no one can speak badly of God. I, I, I find it interesting also that, that Paul starts with this whole talk of sexual impu- um, impurity and immorality. 
You see, the, the nature, the culture in Ephesus at that time was very sexually charged. A lot of the, the pagan worship were, were, were to sex goddesses. And there, there would be orgies and there was prostitution because they felt that's how you were to off, make your offering to the God. But the truth is, is our culture, is our society really any different today? I, I think starting off this way is the exact same thing that was going on in Ephesus. Just turn on the TV or look at social media. Very, very sexually charged. So he's saying live your life in such a way that people see God and not that in your life. And then he, he, he goes on, he says, look, those things that I just talked about, that greed and that sexual immorality, that's all about pleasing myself, right? That's all about being selfish, not the, not the love of God that is selfless. That's about doing things so that I am, am gratified, my gra- satisfied and gratified. Now he's saying the way we talk to each other. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. You see, this kind of talk actually reflects what's going on in our heart. Jesus talks about our heart a lot while he was here on the earth. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus said this, For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. This isn't the only place in the scriptures that he talks about that. You see, whatever is going on in our heart is what tends to come out of our mouth. So if our heart is full of greed, if our heart is full of impurity, then what's going to come out? Obscenity, sexual innuendos, coarse joking. Right? What comes out of your mouth is what your heart is full of. Instead, he's saying, give thanksgiving to God. I know it's cliche, but have an attitude of gratitude. Thank him for his gospel. Thank him for what he's done for us. Thank him for sending Jesus. Thank him for for allowing you to walk in in the way that that Paul is calling us to walk. And thank him for the people around you who are walking with you, who are showing you and helping you see the way. In verse 5, Paul says, For of this you can be sure... No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Whoa. That, that verse scares me a little bit. Let me read it to you without that, that, that part in the center. For all of this, you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Has anyone here ever been greedy? Okay, this is your part. (laughs) Thank you. Has anyone here ever been immoral? Even since knowing Jesus, right? We talked about that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I see that that billboard and I'm thinking, yeah, I wouldn't mind playing for $363 million. Does that mean I can't get in the kingdom of God? Does that mean that Jesus has just abandoned me? I don't believe so. I think when we consider everything else that that Paul has said in his letter this far, he's saying, hey, if you live this way and only this way, if you are worshiping things that are sexual, if you are worshiping things that are about stuff or things or status, if you are worshiping greed and you have completely turned your back on Jesus and everything that he has offered you, then you are an idolator. You are worshiping that and not God. And I believe those people who just completely turn their back on Christ are the ones who he's saying will never inherit the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, Paul goes on to say, as a matter of fact, the, the, the God's wrath is for those who are disobedient. Well, if, you've, if you journey with us through the book of um, Revelation on Wednesday nights, we just wrapped up the tribulation. We just wrapped up the seven bowls of wrath. And believe me, it's going to be ugly when Jesus comes back for those who don't know Jesus Christ. 
And that's what we're talking about here. Those people who turn their back, refuse to repent, and go that other way, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. They're going to spend eternity apart from God, not with Him. And the wrath that is due to us will come upon them. And I'm not a, I'm not a typical fire and brimstone. That was hardly fire and brimstone, I know. But um, that kind of preacher. But the truth is the truth. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He can bridge that gap for you today. You can make that decision to follow Jesus today because we're going to get into darkness and light in a minute. But when we're separated from God, we might as well be dead because we're dead in our sins. And He bridges that gap. He offers you forgiveness for your sinful nature. You can make that decision today. And when we, when we, when we, um, well, I'll just go on to the next verse because I don't know where I was going with that, except stuttering a lot. Um, Therefore, do not be partners with them. Well, who is them? Them is the people who are those idolaters. Them are the people who refuse to turn away from darkness and and turn towards Jesus. And he's saying, don't be partners with them. Some versions, some translations say, don't be partakers with them. In other words, he's saying, don't participate in the things that they're participating with because they can draw you away from your relationship with Jesus. Notice it doesn't say don't associate with them. Listen, if we're to be everyday missionaries, then we have to be with people who are far from Jesus. We have to be able to show them our life. We have to be able to talk to them and tell them how Jesus is changing my life and he can change yours too. So he's not saying don't associate with them. He's saying don't participate with them. Years and years and years ago, I, uh, I semi-professionally shot fireworks. And I was, went to a fireworks training seminar in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And I rode up to Newcastle with um, a bunch of guys from Piqua. We partnered together. And um, I rode with them. So we got up there the night before the seminar, and we went out to dinner. Everything was cool. We were leaving the restaurant, and they start talking about how they wanted to go to a strip club. Now, I was following Jesus at the time, and I thought, I don't want to go to a strip club. But I kept to myself, see where this goes. And they kept talking about it, and they kept talking about it. I said, finally, I said, look, guys, if you're going to go, that's, that's on you but you're going to take me back to the hotel first or I'll sit in the car in the parking lot. You see, I wasn't going to partake with that because I didn't want that being there to pull me away from the relationship that I have with Jesus. So I have a question for you. Who or what are you going to imitate? Who or what are you going to imitate and what does that look like in your life? So Paul goes on, and this is the scripture, this is the verse that gives our our message series its name. In Ephesians 5, 8, Paul says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light of the Lord. Live as children of light. Look, Paul just told us how to live, right? We're to imitate God and we're not to participate in those things that, that where people could talk badly of him because of the way we live in our life. But he's also acknowledging where we came from. We were once darkness, and now when you say yes to Jesus' invitation, you are light. And notice it doesn't say you were once in darkness. It says you once were darkness. Listen, there have been times before I knew Jesus that I was doing things I am not proud of. And sometimes when I did, there was just this, this cloud around me. It was dark. It's because I had no light in me. I was darkness myself. But once I said yes to Jesus, because he is light, I became light, which is what Paul is saying here. I can't help but think back to the garden because everything goes back to the garden. Right, Pastor (laughs) Janine? And before the earth was formed, we find out that, that it was formless, and it was empty, and darkness hovered above the deep. And that deep is the Hebrew word 
Tahom, which means chaotic waters. You see, before there was any creation, when the world was still formless, there was darkness and there was chaos and there was disorder. And then God said, let there be, let there be light. And all of a sudden, the very first thing that God created started the process of bringing order out of the disorder, of bringing order out of the chaos. And I believe that's what Paul is calling for us. Our life, when we were in darkness, before we knew Jesus, was chaotic. It was disordered. But with Jesus in our life, we can have order, and it makes sense. Not only that, he says, live as children of light. That word live is the same word he used in verse 2 that we had translated as walk. He said walk in love. We could say live in love, or here we could say walk as children of light. So what he's saying is, hey, you were darkness. I know, that's where you came from. But now you're a child of light, so live that way. Let other people see your life in such a way that they see light, that they see Jesus. When we live as children of light, we can see and we can grow and we can move towards living and looking more like Jesus every day. Uh, Deb and I put out a, a small garden every year. Um, I like to call it my salsa garden because all I grow are tomatoes and peppers. Um, I tried growing onions one year because, you know, to make salsa, you really need onions too, but I just, I don't know if it's my ground or what. It was probably me, but anyway. So previously, we always bought our plants from a greenhouse, and that's how we started, our tomato plants and our pepper plants. But for Christmas this year, I got this neat little hydroponic garden that had seed starter kit in it. And so we went out and bought, oh, three kinds of tomato plants and two, three, four kinds of pepper plants. And so I started all those seeds in this little hydroponic garden. By the way, our, our garden's going to be a little bigger this year. Um, and um, when they got tall enough, when they got big enough, I had to transplant them actually into dirt when they had their root structure and all that sort of stuff. But this was a month, month and a half ago. Well, it was too cold to put them outside, so I transplanted them into little peat pots and kept them inside. But inside, they don't get enough light during the day to grow. So I bought a grow light. (laughs) But you know what? They grew. The same is true for you. You see, when you live as a child of light, when you're filled with light, you will grow. You will grow. And how do we know? How do you know you're growing? He goes on to say, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. You see, when you're growing, when you're moving closer to Jesus, when you're living as children of light, your life oozes out righteousness, goodness, and truth. All the bad stuff tends to go away. And this good stuff comes out. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. If you're familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we say yes to Jesus, it's found in Galatians 5, 21 and 22, or 20 and 21, I forget. But anyway, it's found in Galatians 5. Um, He talks about all this fruit that starts being produced in your life, and it's things like joy and peace and goodness and righteousness. It's a lot of the same things that Paul's talking about here. So when you, when you are light, when you put the dark life behind you and you are light, these things start pouring out. And notice he says, find out what pleases the Lord. I, I find this a little interesting. You just go, hey, God, what pleases you? And will he tell you? Chances are not. He may. He can. But chances are you're going to go, okay, I'm living as a child of light. So all that old stuff is back. I'm light. I'm moving towards Jesus. I'm going to walk this way. And then you do one of those stumble and fall things. And God goes, now, wait a minute. I want you to go this way. And he course corrects you, right? Maybe a little bit of discipline in your life. And you go, okay, now I know that that doesn't please the Lord. So this does please the Lord. So I'll start walking that way. And then you stumble and fall again 
and he course corrects you again. That's how you can find out. Sorry, I mean, if, if he can tell you audibly or in your spirit, whoo go for it. I mean, we know some of the things from Scripture, right? How we're supposed to live. No sexual immorality, no greed, those types of things. But find out what pleases him is going to come from the way you're living your life in the light. And when you don't, he's going to tell you. He's going to correct you. He's going to discipline you so that you grow along the right way. And I should mention uh, again, that, that that verse and this verse kind of combined is where our message series got its name. And, and the truth is that um, if, if the gospel is your gospel, if you consider what God and what Jesus has done for you, and Paul in, in his letter to the Romans, he calls the gospel my gospel. And I love that. So now it's my gospel too. Because you take ownership of it. You go, wow. Jesus did that for me. That's my gospel. That's my good news. And when you do that, and you really believe that, your only response can be imitate God in love, to put off your old and put on the new and walk as light instead of darkness. That can be your only response, and that's why we named this sermon series what we did. And then Paul goes on in the first part of verse 13. He says, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. I think what he's saying is, hey, we're not meant to only walk in the light of our, for ourselves. We're more than just everyday disciples. We're also everyday missionaries. So go be light in this dark, dark world. Remember, we are not to not associate with those who are still living as darkness because they'll never see the light. But when they do see the light, their darkness is, is exposed. Have you ever been in a, a really, really pitch dark room and lit a match? It lights up the whole thing and it lights up the whole room. I don't care how big it is, how big the room is. I remember we did that once in this room. Blinds were closed and it was at, at um, Advent. And someone, I remember who, walked one candle down the aisle and this whole room was lit up with that one candle in the darkness. That's you in this dark, dark world that we live in. That's you for those people who are far from Jesus. And when you do, it says they become visible. You see, they can't, remember one of the songs we talked about hiding in our shame? They can't hide in their shame anymore because now they know. They can see. And if we journey with them and help them and explain to them how Jesus is changing our life and that, man, he can change your life too, you can become light, God willing, they become light too. That's what we're called to do. That's the everyday missionary part of our vision of being everyday disciples who are becoming everyday missionaries everywhere. And we say everywhere because you don't have to go out on a street corner. You can go to where you work. You can go to where you go to school. You can go to the Y. You can go anywhere and be the light of Jesus in the world that we live in to those who don't know him, who are still living as darkness. So my second question for you today is this. Is your response to the gospel, is your response to your gospel to live as children of light and journey with others as they become light too. In other words, can you say, hey, considering what Jesus has done for me, I'm gonna live as light and I'm gonna go out there and be light. And I want you to think about the people in your life who journeyed with you so that you became light. Now I realize for some of you that was a long time ago. It was 26 years ago for me. But I can name the three people who had the most direct impact, who helped me get out of darkness and into the light. And I bet you many of you can think of those people who journeyed with you so you became light. And then in your next thought process, I want you to think about who can I journey with so they become light? Who journeyed with you? And can they be an example for you to journey with someone else? And then Paul goes on in the next few verses. I'm just going to summarize it for you. He says, he says, take it, or uh, how's he put it? Um, make the most. Make the most of every opportunity. 
to be light. Make the most of every opportunity. He says, because the days are evil. Certainly, our days are evil too, right? Does anyone, can anyone disagree with me that, that the society we live in is just perfect and it's going great? And, or are the days evil for us, just like they were for Paul in Ephesus? But not only that, think about Paul, about how he got to where he is today when he wrote this letter. He's sitting in a prison in Rome writing this letter. But before that, um, let's see, uh, he was blinded. But that was actually a good thing because he was blinded by Jesus. But he was blinded. He was arrested. He was jailed. He was beaten. He was stoned. I think he got jailed again, but got out again. Right? He was run out of town. He was shipwrecked. And now he's sitting in a prison in Rome. You see, he knows firsthand that you never know when your days here on earth are going to be over. You never know when you're going to have your last opportunity to be light in the life of someone else and to receive that light for yourself, that way of life for yourself. So take the most of every opportunity because the days are evil and we never know. And then he tells us, he says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. You see, what goes in us matters. What goes in us forms our heart. And if you remember, what our heart is full of is what comes out. So what goes in us matters. If you're putting all those small G gods like the people of Ephesus were worshiping, sexual immorality, idolatry, greed, obscene language, if you put those things in, debauchery is going to come out. He says, instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music with your heart to the Lord. There's that heart thing again. Always giving thanks to God, the Father, for everything. You see, when you are filled with the Spirit, and you keep filling yourself with the Spirit, and you keep filling yourself with the Spirit, those things that are bad in you, those things that are causing you to be far apart from God, the darkness that's still in your life tends to spit out. Think of this. Now, I cook and Deb usually washes the dishes in our house. But on occasion, I like to help out. The truth is, when she cooked, I washed the dishes. So, I think of the time that I, and I do this all the time, I don't know why I do it. It's really not for this sermon illustration, although it works. Um, I'll wash a glass right? And I've got a soapy dish rag and I wash the glass and there's a whole bunch of soap in the bottom there. And when I rinse it out, and instead of rinsing it out, dumping it, rinsing it out, dumping, I like to just watch the water fill it up. Because what happens to the soap? Have it, have you, has anyone ever done this? Yeah. <laughs> the soap rises to the top and eventually as the cup becomes overflowing with water, the soap goes out. And eventually, I suppose if you, I've never tried this, You could drink the water that's left inside because there's no soap left. It's all filled with the Holy Spirit at that point. The same is true with ourselves. When we fill ourselves up with the Holy Spirit to the point that we're overflowing, all the obscene language, all the coarse jokes, all the sexual innuendos, all the things that lead to greed go out. And we can sing psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit to each other. We can be kind and compassionate, and show love the way Jesus shows love to us. Not only that, we tend to want to sing our praise to God as well. When all we have is the Spirit, when you're madly in love with Jesus, that's what comes out. He is our joy. He is our righteousness. He is my all. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and always give God thanks for everything. Remember, he says, from the heart, our talk reflects what's going on inside of our heart. And if you're filled with the Spirit, then the Spirit's going to come out in songs and psalms and hymns of praise. So my last question for you today is simple. Who or what are you filled with? Who or what are you filled with? 
So when our kids left, if you're a guest with us today, I just wanna let you know that when our kids left to go to Kids Connect, um, they're actually learning the same thing we are. They're studying Ephesians 5, 1 through 20 today. And they're learning about walking in the light. And they're learning about being filled with the Holy Spirit just on a level that they can understand. I think sometimes that maybe I should be with them instead of in here. So we have this, these things that we call car conversation. They're just a couple of questions that you can ask your kids on the way home once you get in the car, just to kind of see how they are responding to what they've heard. But beware, be prepared, because you should be prepared to answer those questions yourself. These questions, by the way, work for adult to adult as well. So the two we have today is how is living in darkness different from living in light? And the second one is kind of that everyday missionary part of it, Who are you thankful for that Jesus has put in your life? Remember, I asked you, who journeyed with you to help you learn who Jesus is, that he is the light? And you might even follow that up with a third question. I didn't put it on here, but maybe it's, hey, who can we journey with so they see the light of Jesus in their life? So this letter that Paul wrote that we call Ephesians is all about how to live our life as an everyday disciple. So what do we take from this from um, how we can live our life as everyday disciples? Well, first of all, everyday disciples choose to imitate God. Everyday disciples choose to imitate God and to walk in the way of love, to walk in the way of light, And at one other point, I didn't talk about it, but he says, walk in the wise. Remember, he said, hey, learn what pleases Jesus. Learn what pleases God. So walk in the way of the wise as well. Secondly, secondly, everyday disciples are called to live as children of light ourselves and journey with others to become light too. Don't be selfish. This isn't just for us. Is for everyone. That's the way the kingdom of God will grow, is when we journey with others so they become light too. And then I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. The third thing that we can learn in how to live as an everyday disciple is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Out of the overflow, we can do things that we normally wouldn't do on our own. You see, when we're filled to overflowing, all the bad stuff comes out, but then all the good stuff comes out. And we do things that we wouldn't normally do. Now, if you've known me for much of my walk with Jesus, you may know that um, early in my walk and middle in my walk, and honestly, not so long ago, I really didn't like to deal with kids. Just didn't like it. I, I sign, kind of sometimes joke that maybe that's why God didn't bless me with any children of my own. I have three amazing stepchildren and seven beautiful, amazing, can't wait to be with them grandchildren. But I, I kind of joke that God knows me. He knows where my heart was. Maybe, maybe kids for Mark isn't such a good idea. And then, and then, oh, how many years ago, Jenny, did we do uh, preschool together? She's, she's laughing. It was a long time ago. Kathy Allison, who was Pastor Vern's wife at the time, she kind of oversaw our Wednesday night ministry. In those days, we actually sent a bus out in the community and brought kids back in. And she goes, Mark, I want you and Jenny. Now, Jenny doesn't have any children either. I want you and Jenny to take care of the preschool class. Are you serious? And we did. Any, anyone here know A.J. Burroughs? You know, 6'7", A.J. Burroughs? Yeah, he was in my preschool class. He's a, what, a junior? Yeah, junior in high school now? He was in my preschool class. We tried to teach the story that we were supposed to teach, and then we played a lot of duck, duck, goose in that class <laughs> because I had no idea, no clue how to deal with preschoolers And honestly, I didn't want to be there. 
But you see, over the years, Jesus and the Holy Spirit has filled me to overflowing to where I can do things that I normally wouldn't do. Shortly before, was it before Christmas? Right around Christmas, wasn't it, Javon? Yeah, somewhere around Christmas. I remember it was on a Wednesday night, and we were over there. We were studying the book of Hebrews. I can tell you where Siobhan and I were studying. God said, hey, you're supposed to go uh, volunteer at CORE, Council of Religious Education. You know the bus, the, the, the religious education bus or trailer? I'm going, oh, oh, no, God. You remember me? I'm the one who doesn't like kids. But I was overflowing with the Holy Spirit. So I walked up to Siobhan and I said, Siobhan Puckett's one of the lead, or is the lead teacher and kind of the, I call her the de facto executive director of Council of Religious Education. But I walked up to her, I said, hey, do you have any room left for um, classroom aides? And she said, I do. And secretly I was hoping they were when I couldn't do it. And I said, well, when do you have one? She goes, how about Thursday afternoon at one? I went, oh man. And I said, yes. I remember going into Tim's office. I said, Tim, uh, I'm leaving uh, the, first thir- the first Thursday I went. I said, I'm going to go volunteer at Council of Religious Education. He said, you're going to do what? <laughs> you're not, no. I said, yeah. He came back, I came back and he said, how was it? I said, it was amazing. Are you going back? Yep. Thursday was my last day. It was hard to say goodbye to those kids. I had one little boy, every, every Thursday, he'd come up to me and he'd grab me and he'd go, you're mine. <laughs> Callie Davis, I, I was, the schedules over there get messed up sometimes. So I had her class, even though she wasn't my regular class for, I don't know, two or three weeks. And afterwards, last in first service, she came out and she goes, my bestie. And she gives me a hug. You see, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit overflowing, you do things that are just not you. Because it's not you. It's him. It's all him. And when you have light in your life and you are the light, then the light has no no place to go but into darkness. And that is to shine out. So my bottom line for you today is this. It's pretty simple. It's everything we've already said. When we live as children of light, we grow, right? We grow in light. We're filled with the Holy Spirit to overflowing and we can impact those people around us. Let me say that just slightly different. When we follow Jesus, we are changed by Jesus and we are committed to the mission of Jesus. This whole message series is all about walking as an everyday disciple. And that bottom line is our definition using different words of an everyday disciple. And you know what? I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one who has a story like the one I just told. That many of you have been filled so full with the, over, uh, with the Holy Spirit that you're overflowing and he enabled you to do something that you wouldn't normally do on your own. Or maybe you have a story of how someone journeyed with you so you came out of the darkness and into the light. Or maybe right now you're journeying with someone else. Listen, I want to hear your story. I truly do. I think there is nothing better than to sit over a cup of coffee or a soda and say, hey, let me tell you how Jesus is changing my life and this is what I was able to do. So you have a connect card in the pew in front of you. If you have a story and you're willing to share it, you want to share it, fill out that connect card or you can do it on the app as well. And just put, I have a story. We'll know what it means. I'll give you a call and we'll set up a time when we can talk.